I don't think Bob Mueller ever thought that George Papadopoulos would be going vocal and going on TV and programs like yours and telling the truth. Bob Mueller, you know, he's continuously lying. I mean, I really feel that Americans were brainwashed. This was a psyop. I've known this story for two years, okay? And that's why I wrote my book. And if anybody who reads my book, they could... It's almost like a sneak peek into what's going to happen moving forward in these new investigations. If uh, he doesn't fight back, what happened in 2016 is going to happen again. You could hear a needle drop in the room. This is this is like a bombshell, what I'm saying right now. And then all of a sudden, Donald Trump calls the Italian prime minister today, where they're talking about immigration. <laughs> okay? I don't think that's what they were talking about, quite frankly. I think the Italians are scared to death right now. So they had interests in colluding with Brennan and the FBI to spy on us, to undermine us, and to assure that if Trump was elected president, he'd be weakened. How the hell do the Australians in the UK know what's in the FISA awards? I know uh, Tr Donald Trump, I know his team, I worked with him for 11 months, I was on his transition team, and he's not going to allow this to, to fly. So treason, yes or no, speed round, James Comey. Yes. Peter Stroke. Yes. Loretta Lynch. Yes. McCabe. Yes. Mueller. Yes. Rosenstein. Yes. Hillary. Yes. The Oars. Yes. John Brennan. Yes. James Clapper. Yes. Valerie Jarrett. Yes. Obama. Yes. Wow, 100%. And All right, everyone's ready. Hey guys, it's Fleckus. This week we are talking to George Papadopoulos. He's out with a new book, Deep State Target, How I Got Caught in the Crosshairs of the Plot to Bring Down President Trump. It's a fantastic read. The link is in the bio. Get yourself a copy today. George, thank you for being with me. Thanks I appreciate a lot. you appreciate having it. me, and I'm really excited to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Um, so you've been in the news lately. Obviously, your name's all over the place. Uh, your involvement with the Trump campaign got you into some of the, of the Mueller investigation and with Russia and everything, and everyone kind of thought you were this Russian spy who, <laughs> you know, was plotting with Trump to collude with the Russians and do all these things that weren't happening. Um, tell us what actually did happen. How did you get involved uh, working with Trump, and what were you doing before that? You've been targeted before, not necessarily for your Trump ties, but actually your ties with Israel on your energy work. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely correct. And uh, thanks a lot for, you know, doing this because I think it's very important. Um, so I had been working in uh, Washington, D.C. at the Hudson Institute. It's a conservative think tank. It's basically the rival to the Heritage Foundation um, for five years leading up to my time working on both the Ben Carson and Donald Trump campaigns. And during my time in D.C., when I was working at the Hudson Institute, I was working with three um, very prominent um colleagues of mine who just were basically running the Pentagon under the Reagan, George H.W. Bush administrations and the George W. Bush administrations, um, Scooter Libby, Doug Fyth, and Seth Cropsey. <clears throat> so for five years, these were my mentors and colleagues. And with these three personalities and others, I was really focused on a sensitive project that had to do with energy discoveries in the Mediterranean. And for many people who don't understand, in 2010, Energy was discovered for the first time in history offshore Israel and Cyprus and just in general in that part of the world because for so many years before that, including from like 1920 up until the Iraq war, the Middle East in general was where all the oil was in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Kuwait. And now all of a sudden in 2010, we find oil and natural gas in Israel. So right away, um, I was interested in seeing how I could shape U.S. foreign policy towards that part of the world with that change emerging. And it wasn't just that change that emerged. Uh, in 2010, the relationship between Israel and Turkey collapsed. And then you had the Arab Spring that was mm -hmm. reverberating through the entire region. So basically, what my colleagues and I were promoting, just to summarize a very complex geopolitical story, was the Israelis should not focus on working with Turkey anymore, but should focus on working with Greece and Cyprus. And that was one. And two that the U.S. should not support the Muslim Brotherhood, which had gained power in Tunisia, Egypt, and even Turkey, which they still have power in Turkey today, but that the U.S. should basically support more secular, I don't want to call it autocratic governments in that part of the world, but more secular and more Western-oriented governments in countries like Egypt and um, uh, other areas. And that's what we promoted. So when the Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt and Sisi was the leader, we were basically explaining to Congress and to the State Department why the Obama administration should not support him. And fortunately, Sisi came to power, he overthrew Morsi, and then we had a pro-West government in Egypt today. That was the first thing. And the second thing is, the Israelis should not cooperate with Turkey and cooperate instead with Greece and Cyprus for two reasons. One, 
to promote their security and security in general in that part of the world, and two, to export energy to Europe through those countries and not Turkey. So this is what we were promoting, and it was viewed as anathema to what Obama and their administration was promoting. Obama was promoting the Israeli-Turkish relationship and the Muslim Brotherhood in that part of the world. So you could understand we were... Di- we had divergent opinions. Mm-hmm. Opposite side. Yeah, an opposite side. So that situation, that was, I'm trying to summarize five years of very sensitive like work, put a target on me that followed me through my time on both the Ben Carson campaigns and the Trump campaigns, including what I've been told was a FISA warrant that uh, was issued on me in, in some illicit fashion by the Comey FBI to spy on me for my ties to the Israelis which uh, Bob Mueller himself has recently noted in his own report that for some reason many people in the media overlooked and they wanted to focus on my fake Russia ties. So that's the backstory of why there was a target on me. And um, secondly, I joined the Ben Carson campaign um, where he's for four months until he drops out. And then I joined the Trump campaign in uh, March of 2016. And that's when things get very strange. So by the time I joined the Trump campaign, Donald Trump had been very vocal about working with Russia at the geopolitical level. And I, as a foreign policy advisor, had absolutely no ties whatsoever in Russia because I just explained that all my ties were in the Middle East. I said, okay, how am I going to help this campaign if I have no Russia ties? And I was working at a company called the London Center for International Law Practice. Now, this place is very, very important because this organization is part of how this setup first started. This is an organization in central London that I was a director at that's filled with a lot of West, uh, Western diplomats and ex-Western intelligence types who are affiliated with MI6, the CIA, FBI, um, and just you know think tanks and very prominent lawyers from the top law firms in the world were affiliated with this organization. So I tell them, you know what, I'm kind of bored here in London. <laughs> uh, I don't really want to be a director anymore. I have this new position. I'm going to be joining the Trump campaign, and they were horrified. And it was at that moment that I was taken by one of the directors to meet another director who was called Arvinder Sambe. And Arvinder Sambe is probably one of the most uh, important figures in this entire Russia probe who has never been discussed before. And this woman was the FBI's legal attache in the UK and also had a personal relationship, working relationship with Bob Mueller dating back to 9-11, And lastly, she introduced the uh, equivalent of the Deputy Attorney General of the UK, Alison Saunders, to Bruce Orr four days before the infamous Trump Tower meeting at this dinner of the Orrs that Congress is now investigating. So this woman has never been discussed publicly. I speak about her in my book, Deep State Target, and there's a reason I do. And in my case, I'll explain why she fits into this investigation. She tells me, oh, it's bad that you're joining the Trump campaign, but if you're going to leave us, we have some people in Rome that could help you regarding whatever you're trying to do with Trump and Russia and other governments. And I say, that's that's great. You know, this is a director at a company I worked for. I didn't expect that. I didn't know that she was working with FBI, which she was. And she's like, go to Rome and uh, meet this guy there. And I say, okay, I go to Rome at this university called Link Campus. It's uh, And David Ignatius has written extensively about this place. It's a spy school, but it's not a Russian spy school. It's a CIA, FBI spy school in Rome. And that's where I meet Joseph Mifsud. And Joseph Mifsud is the guy at the epicenter of this entire Russia story, this Russia hoax that told me eventually that the Russians had Hillary Clinton's emails. And um, I could get into my subsequent meetings with him. But more importantly than even that, uh, recently this guy has been outed in Italy where he's been hiding out and he's being protected. Uh, He's changed his identity. Somebody's giving him money. And uh, there's speculation that he was coordinating directly with the FBI himself, this guy, Michael Gaeta, who was uh, the FBI's liaison in Rome. And now Donald Trump himself, just today, as I'm talking to you, Um, Two days after I was on Fox and Friends talking about how Joseph Mipsud was found in Italy, he called the Italian prime minister today. And there's a big uproar. There's a big potential diplomatic scandal that's brewing right now between Italy and the United States about what to do with this guy, Joseph Mipsud. 
who's been discovered in Rome, and he's on the payroll of this CIA spy school still. So I'm gonna, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what happens now with this individual, now that he's been found in Rome, and whether the Italians cooperate and either extradite him to the United States or at least allow him to be interviewed by members of Congress who are investigating the investigators now. And originally, they made it seem like, or Mueller did at least, made it seem like that Misfood was a Russian and <laughs> he was involved with the Russians, and yeah. that's like how it all ties in with Russia. In reality, it seems like his handlers are at least Western intelligence. Is that is that accurate? Absolutely. And this is the this is the this is why people are going public now and actually calling my story potentially the biggest case of entrapment in political history, because if the theory is correct, which all the evidence suggests that he was working with Western intelligence, okay, in, ge in a general term, and potentially the FBI, if he's going to me and acting like a Russian intermediary and talking about Russian emails and all this stuff and entrapping me, and then the FBI uses that against me when I had nothing to do with Russia just to frame me mm -hmm. and to try and put Donald Trump's presidency in danger and... Uh, then that's what really needs to be investigated right now. And Bob Mueller, you know, he's continuously lying to the American public and to the world and saying, no, no, this guy was a Russian agent, even though he's being photographed with Boris Johnson, who was the Secretary of State of the UK. He trains MI5, MI6 and CIA figures in Rome today. And Bob Mueller, in my estimation, and quite frankly, this is what I really believe, I don't think he ever thought my story would come out. I don't think Bob Mueller ever thought that George Papadopoulos would be going vocal and going on TV and programs like yours and telling the truth because he probably thought this is a young guy. He's scared to death. You know, he's going to go disappear and hide and, yeah. you know, and, and no one's ever going to hear Serve from him. Serve your time and disappear. Serve, but the way that I, and my book that I wrote, Deep State Target, and the way my wife was going public and discussing this guy, Mifsud, because she actually worked in Europe and knew his ties to the Europeans and to the socialists there, and even to Hillary Clinton. I was going to say that Clinton's as well. He was definitely a supporter and a donor to her. Yeah, so yeah. so what I learned by my wife, at the time when I was like in discussions with Mueller's team, she was like, this, why are you pleading guilty? I'm like, what do you mean? She said, do you know that Joseph Mifsud was attending a dinner with Hillary Clinton during the 2016 campaign, along with a senior-level Italian diplomat who was uh, the head of the socialist group there? I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought he was a Russian spy. She says, no, no, he wasn't a Russian spy. And I didn't know what to do. My, you know, my life was like moving very quickly. The Mueller team was attacking me. And when my wife told me this information, the FBI went after her. And were trying to, to uh, threaten her and tell her to leave the country and don't talk at all about what you know about Mifsud and, you know, all this kind of stuff that no one knew about. Um, so the story, I mean, uh, it really is going to probably involve Italy a lot more than anybody could possibly imagine um, because of his connection to Mifsud and his role and what he was up to. And it's also going to involve uh, the UK and Australia, and I could explain how they're going to be mm. involved too. When it comes to Mifsud, um, so basically the entrapment was, hey, you should meet with this guy, and then you meet with this guy, and they say, why did you meet with this guy? Pretty basic, but it's it's right in, right in front of us, pretty blatant. What was the meeting itself like? Yeah, so, so I... So that's a great question. So I meet Mifsud in Rome at the spy school that the CIA and FBI train their agents at. Okay, I didn't even know what was going on. I go to Rome, and <laughs> as soon as I get there, I'm like, okay, this isn't a normal university. Do you know why? Because the rector of the university was the former Italian foreign minister, this short guy called Vincenzo Scotti. He's like 70, and he like shakes my hands. Like, oh, so you're Papadopoulos? I'm like, yeah. Who are you? It's like I I was the Italian foreign minister. I'm like, oh wow. So he's like, come with me. And then he introduces me to this guy, Mifsud, along with another director at this uh, company I worked for. And Mifsud, he's like, he knows everything about me. Immediately upon, I don't know anything about this guy, but he knows everything about me. So I was handed off to him, and he starts to probe me like an intel officer, like asking me like what, do, what my motivations are for working for Trump. Uh, what I believe about Ukraine and Russia and Europe in general, what my religion is, if I'm if I'm sympathetic to Russia or not. So I never understood why a first meeting would feel like that, but that's what was happening. And <clears throat> he's like, I'm going to be your man around the world. 
I'm going to introduce you guys to leaders in Europe, Asia, and Russia. So I said to myself, okay, this is interesting that maybe I hit the gold mine with this guy because he's going to introduce me and others in the campaign to high level networking, high level guys. And Trump at the time, his weakness was foreign policy. Mm -hmm. So what better person than him? That's what I thought. So you didn't realize there were Clinton ties at this point? I had no idea. Absolutely no idea. I mean, at that point, you know, this is March 2016. We have no idea what we know now, of course. So and he never said he was connected to Clinton at all. If he did, of course, I wouldn't yeah, be talking yeah. to him. I didn't know, like I said, he was attending a dinner with Clinton about four months after he was setting me up. But that's a different thing. So he's like, I know everyone. I know Putin and Trump. If he meets Putin, it'll make sense of what he's talking about publicly. And I said, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Maybe it would be a good idea for Trump to go on a foreign policy trip to Russia and Europe. Mm-hmm. And if you could be an intermediary, that's awesome. Especially at that time. At that time, it wasn't Russia, Russia, Russia. No. Russia just, you know, was a, a normal a normal situation, there not like it nothing, is now. There was nothing nefarious about what mm-hmm. Trump was talking about regarding Russia um, at that point, because obviously Trump was just talking about his willingness to work with another country to promote stability around the world, mm-hmm. not colluding. Yeah. Um, so... The, here's where things get very strange, and what I think the investigation now into this guy is going to try and explain. A week after I meet this guy in Rome, I'm in my office in London at this London Center for International Law Practice, and they're like, you have to go meet Mifsud again. I'm like, why do I have to meet Joseph Mifsud? He's like, because he's going to introduce you to the niece of, <laughs> of Vladimir Putin. And I'm like, I just met him, and now he's introducing me to the niece of Vladimir Putin? This is a, like amazing. Yeah. And the company itself, which I explained, is run by like the MI6 and FBI, is telling me, go meet him and her. So I go to a hotel across the street, and I meet Mifsud with this young lady. And he's like, this is the niece of Vladimir Putin, and she's going to be introducing you to the Kremlin and to the Russian ambassador in London, and you're going to be like this Russia man now. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing, because I did want to actually meet with Russian officials at, mm-hmm. at that time, simply as a foreign policy advisor to understand what the relationship really was about, not for anything wrong. Probably exciting, too. You're yeah. 28, yeah. adding value to the campaign. Yeah, exactly. You're like, yeah, I yeah. can hook it up. Because for me, it was like, at that, at that point, I was going to be in Israel like the week after, <clears throat> and I was going to be talking at an energy conference with the U.S. Energy Secretary, Ernest Manez. Um, so I was like very well connected in Israel and the Middle East. But, you know, a lot of people have connections there. You know, so I didn't, I necessarily wouldn't have stood out. But with the Russia angle, I thought maybe I could stand out. So this guy was acting like he could make things happen. And I meet this young lady. She's not speaking English. She's like not smart. She's not, I mean, she's just like kind of like sitting there. And I'm like, okay, a week after that, I get emails from Mifsud and this person. And she's acting like she's an intermediary between Putin and myself and others, right? And I'm just like emailing her. And I'm like, are you the same person I met in London? Because you don't sound like the same person. And later, as Bob Mueller just explained in his report, Mifsud was like fabricating emails that were being sent by this person Mm. to make it seem like she was somebody she's not. So one, who was this person I was meeting? Two, who was handling Joseph Mifsud? And three, why was Joseph Mifsud lying about all this bizarre Russia information that he had and these Russia contacts that he had that he that he presented to me. Um, so after that meeting, I'm being a little suspicious with Mifsud and I'm, I'm back in London, I'm doing my thing. Um, and then the Australians reach out to me. This is why Australia... And is this at the point, is this May of this 2016? Is, no, this is April. This is, okay, this is before that, okay. This is why this is really suspicious because uh, like April 10 or like April 15, I have the Australian embassy reach out to me. I'm like, why is the Australian embassy reaching out to me? Donald Trump never talked about Australia. He never said the word Australia. I've never been to Australia, and I have nothing to do with the Australian government. So why is the Australian government reaching out to me in April of 2016 in London to meet with me? And that's when I meet this very suspicious woman named Erica Thompson. And she's this is a key person in this scandal, um, because I think she was like some sort of spy. And she was like probably surreptitiously recording my conversations or doing something that she shouldn't have been doing. And she was trying to like sleep with me, essentially. She was acting like some sort of honeypot. Honeypot, yeah. Yeah. And she's like, hey, you know, Trump's a pariah. We hate him in Australia. He's a threat to global security. You shouldn't be working for him. And I was laughing like, ah, oh, OK. He's anti-TPP. <laughs> He's I'm anti-TPP. sure that was part of it. He's anti-TPP. So I laugh it off. 
A week after that, contact Joseph Mifsud drops this bizarre information in my lap on April 26th. Hey, you know the Russians have Hillary's emails. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? So j just so everyone who's watching this understands, on April 26th, Joseph Mifsud tells me that the Russians have Hillary Clinton's emails, okay? Up until that moment, he introduced me to no one in the Russian government, except a young person that he was calling the niece of Vladimir Putin, who obviously was not the niece of Vladimir Putin. Yeah. But he, this guy, miraculously had the information that everyone in the world wanted at that moment. <laughs> and that was at the right. reaches out to you and it's like... And it's like, and, and not only that, usually when you're, if you have real information like that, you don't say it at a five-star hotel in front of 50 people yeah. sitting around you like he did it to me. You do it in a quiet space and you're really, you mm -hmm. know, he's, it's like me and you talking right now about the weather and I'm about and I'm eating an egg sandwich. Hey George, you know what the Russians have emails. So when he told me this, I was just kind of like dumbfounded. Like what are you talking about? What are you why are you telling me this? And that's when my life in London became very strange. After that meeting, I had two guys from the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency at the US Embassy reach out to me called uh, Gregory Baker and Terence Dudley, and I really hope that these guys are being investigated by Congress because I think they were part of some sort of uh, surveillance or maybe even entrapment, I don't know what they were doing, but they reached out to me on like May 3rd or May 4th, like a week after Mifsud. And they're like talking to me, they're asking me about Trump, about Russia, about just general things, about my background. And on May 6th, I get an email from Erica Thompson, that same girl, and she's like this, oh, can you meet with my boss, Alexander Downer, on May 10th? I'm like... Okay, and I Google Alexander Downer. He's like a huge politician. He's like the most senior politician in Australia. And he's a Clint. I didn't know he was connected to Clinton. And I didn't know he had like an espionage background because, you know, I met many ambassadors in my life, but none had the be did what he did to me. And I want to explain what happened in this meeting with Alexander Downer on May 10th that apparently sparked this investigation or was some part of the predicate that resulted in this investigation. Um, I'm sitting down with Alexander Downer, just like you and I are, like basically this far apart. And I had given an interview in the Times of London like four days before I met him, which is like London's top newspaper. And I said that David Cameron should retract and apologize for calling Trump divisive and stupid about his Muslim ban comments. And it became like this massive story around the world and you know there was some tension in the campaign and Donald Trump himself actually saved my job through Hope Hicks. I asked Hope Hicks am I fired for this interview I gave he says no he liked it so Trump himself saved my job it's a funny story so the reason I'm mentioning this interview is because that's what Alexander Downer how he started the conversation I'm sitting down I'm like hello ambassador how are you and before he says anything to me he's like I'm here to tell you two things one, you should leave my friend David Cameron alone, meaning the UK Prime Minister, and you better tell your boss, Donald Trump, to never talk about my friend David Cameron again, threatening me. Mm -hmm. And I was, like, shocked. Like, this is an Australian diplomat castigating an American advisor on a rival political campaign about the British. And I was just kind of, like, taken aback. Okay. Right away, he pulls his phone out like this. And he holds it up to me like this, and I feel right away he's spying on me, or he's recording me. I felt like I was in the twilight zone, like this, not even surreptitiously, <laughs> just, like this overt. Just kind of sneak it out and ask some questions. He was this overt about it, like where I'm, and I was so uncomfortable, where he's looking at me with a stern look in his face, asking me questions, and he holds his phone up like this every time he asks me questions. So obviously. He was spying and recording. Did you ask him if you were he was, he was recording? Did you no, say, no, 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 no. I, I, you know why? Because I was thinking to myself, this can't be happening. I can't. This guy. There's no way in hell that this guy's really spying on me. Like I know he is, and my my imagination's running wild. I said, because there's no way an ambassador of an allied government would be spying on an American in London, would he? Mm. So then he gets into these strange tangents of. Hey, George, you know, I know all about your background in the energy business in the Middle East and Israel and Cyprus, and I'm just letting you know that what you're promoting is wrong. One, and he said, did you know that I was the UN envoy to Cyprus in 2014? And I know all about Cyprus and Israel 
and uh, you're wrong and you shouldn't be advising Donald Trump on what your ideas are. Then right away, the phone comes out with my response. Okay, so <laughs> he was, think about that. Okay, so I was <laughs> like, all right, am I going to just sit here and tell this guy stop recording me and stop spying on me? Or am I just going to play along? And I just played along. So then he starts getting into these tangents of why Obama's this uppity, arrogant guy and why Clinton should be president and why Obama's the, a very horrible person um, and why Trump has no chance of winning. And I don't remember Russia ever being brought up, especially by me, because that wasn't the point of talking to an Australian official. All I remember was he was asking me questions and pulling his phone out. Okay. Now, I want the viewers to understand the bizarre context of this meeting. Fast forward to my testimony to the Congress. Actually, no, before that. Fast forward to my interviews with Mueller and the FBI. Seven months before this bizarre New York Times story came out about me and him drinking or whatever, I tell Mueller and Andrew Goldstein, who was one of the top prosecutors involved in my case, guys, I don't know what this guy Downer is or what he was up to, but I think he was spying on me or recording my conversation. And Andrew Goldstein, okay, himself tells me, how did you know he was recording your conversation? Like, and I was shocked. Like, he's telling me that Alexander Downer was spying on you. And what do I do to Andrew Goldstein? Exactly what I just did to you. I said, this is what he was doing. He was pulling his phone out and doing this. You could hear a needle drop in the room. I said it in front of Goldstein, Zelensky, another prosecutor of Mueller who was involved in my case, and the two FBI agents and, and my lawyers. And it was as if I said something that should have never been, one, known about, and two, repeated. Okay? Fast forward, I get this bizarre story in the New York Times about Downer. Okay? And after that, I'm testifying to Congress in October of 2018 with, in front of Mark Meadows and John Radcliffe. And actually, my transcript is public now. So I, I highly recommend everyone watching this goes and Googles George Papadopoulos' testimony to the House Oversight Committee because it's a very interesting fa and fast read, all 239 we'll pages. We'll put the link in the bio yeah. for that. And why is this important? And because Mark Meadows, Mark Meadows, probably the top ally of Trump in Congress, is asking me a couple questions like this. Did you have any inclination that you were being recorded in any of your meetings? That was one question he said. And two... Were you ever presented with any transcripts of your meetings with people like Joseph Mifsud, Alexander Downer, or Stefan Halper? And I was like, no. What are you talking about, basically? And I said, the only thing I remember was Alexander Downer and Stefan Halper playing with their phones, and I think they're, they were recording me. So I said this under oath, okay? So I remember Mark Meadows and the members of Congress nodding, basically telling me, without telling me, and this is in the transcript, that the U.S. government is in, is in possession of transcripts with you, Joseph Mifsud. Okay, this is this is like a bombshell. What I'm saying right now, Alexander Downer and Stefan Halper, meaning I was being spied on and had my conversations illicitly recorded for purposes that are not yet clear. Okay, so I highly rec recommend everybody looks into that, and that's why I've been very, very, very vocal about why Donald Trump needs to declassify the FISA documents, the FISA warrants, the 302s, and any of this evidence that was used against myself and other Trump, Trump associates who were under surveillance. And he's looking at you, asking you questions, pulling out his phone and pointing like this to you, like as you're talking. What would you do? You know what I did? I was shocked. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. But this guy is obviously spying on me, but do I tell him to stop spying on me? When Mark Meadows went public like three weeks ago and said that ambassadors were conspiring with the FBI to undermine Trump, I knew who he was talking about. He was talking about Downer. But everybody didn't understand. Mm -hmm. They were like, ambassador? Oh, ooh. I've known this story for two years. Okay. And that's why I wrote my book. And if anybody who reads my book, they could. It's almost like a sneak peek into what's going to happen moving forward in these new investigations. All these guys that I'm talking to you about, they're all going to get investigated. And the Australians and the British and the Italians are going to be caught up in this. And people are currently flipping on these people, it sounds yeah, yeah, like. Yeah. And they're basically cooperating with the Trump administration. Yeah. Can you touch on that, kind of sure. who's flipped and who's kind of, sure. um, yeah, I guess what's coming what's coming in the future. Sure. So the the Italians have already flipped. And that's they're pretty smart. 
the the countries that are really at risk are the UK, Australia, and Italy. Now, um, what do they always say? The first deal is always the best deal, right? Or the guy that flips first is probably going to get the best deal. And Italy seems to be flipping already. And let me explain what I mean by this. So um, the day the Mueller report was released, Joseph Mifsud was discovered in, in Rome, where he was uh, actually living like a block from the U.S. embassy. Hiding in plain sight. Yeah, hiding in plain sight. <laughs> it's kind of like bin Laden hiding next to like the Pakistani military, like, who were like, oh, he was living there? <laughs> so the guys who were like supposedly trying to kill him were like hiding him and supporting him. It was like the same thing in Italy. So the question is, were the Italians actively hiding him, or did the FBI tell them to hide him? And I think that's why um, Donald Trump called the Italian prime minister today, two days after my interview I gave on Fox, Fox and Friends about this particular issue. And then Dan Bongino was on Jesse Waters' show yesterday, and uh, Donald Trump tweeted the segment where they're talking about my statements regarding Mifsud in Italy. And then all of a sudden Donald Trump calls the Italian prime minister today where they're talking about immigration. <laughs> Okay, I don't think that's what they were talking about, quite frankly. Now, um, so I think, and also my wife, she's Italian, and you know she's been very vocal about this story, and some of her comments have made front-page news in Italy about Mifsud in Italy, and I think the Italians are scared to death right now, and they want to just not jeopardize the relationship with Trump, um, or with the U.S., for that matter, and I think they're going to end up flipping and giving up Mifsud and probably talking about who his handlers were in the FBI or whoever was handling him because it wasn't Russia. That's one. Um, two, there's a lot of reports now that the UK and Australia are begging Donald Trump not to declassify FISA warrants. And that begs the question, how the hell do the Australians in the UK know what's in the FISA warrants mm -hmm. if they were not spying or if they were not involved in providing evidence or fake evidence to the Comey FBI to look to have the Trump campaign under surveillance. So Donald Trump decided like th three weeks ago, I think that he's going to end up declassifying that information, w whether the UK or Australia want him to or not. So that's obviously going to implicate the British and the Australians and like how they were s spying. And in my book, Deep State Target, I give a play by play of all my encounters with the British. And there was only one campaign advisor who was dealing with both the British and the Australians. That was me. To the extent that the British government emailed me Theresa May's letter of congratulations to Donald Trump when he was elected president, I think in when the election in November. So I still have Theresa May's letter of congratulations that she sent to Donald Trump. That goes, to, and I ended up sending it to Steve Bannon, who I, I assume gave it to uh, Donald Trump. That just goes to show you the extent that the British were keeping tabs on me. That one, they sent me that letter, and two, as I explained in my book, all the meetings I was having with them coincided when, one, there was an operation by Stefan Halper against me in London in September, and in October when there were FISA warrants issued. So unless, like, Stefan Halper was, like, some rogue guy mm -hmm. on an operation in London against me and the British had no idea, you know, I find that absurd. Obviously, the British were involved in this up with Halper against me, and that's going to be revealed. And two, as I explained earlier, with Alexander Downer and his bizarre spying in the transcripts, it's going to implicate the Australians. Now, what's my opinion on all this? Trump needs to do exactly what he did with the Italians. He needs to call Theresa May, and he needs to call the Australian Prime Minister. He needs to get to the bottom of what they were up to. And through their help, hopefully, he could get information to help incriminate people who were conspiring against his campaign in the Comey FBI and possibly the Brennan CIA, because it's all foreign government's involvement. And the Obama administration is not in power anymore, so I have no idea why the Italians, the British, and the Australians would be trying to protect the Obama administration folks to, the, to jeopardize their relationship with Donald Trump, unless they're planning on trying to interfere again in 2020 and undermine Donald Trump, which actually is already happening right now. The Australian government and people affiliated with the Australian government are giving millions of dollars to the Bernie Sanders campaign. Now, if I was Donald Trump and I was a Trump administration, I wouldn't stand by while this is happening. I would either force the Australians to deliver all information they have or I would sanction them. If you don't do that, they're going to interfere again and possibly undermine you this time again.
So that's basically they were complicit in what seems like a coup. It was a coup. A full-blown coup. Now, now, people ask me, why would the Australians and the British and all these governments collude with the CIA and the FBI? In 2016, you had a renegade candidate called Donald Trump who was rampaging and threatening to upend both international security cooperation and agreements and trade agreements, which the British, the Australians, and other governments had many vested interests in prolonging and um, promoting, such as a Trans-Pacific Partnership, assuring that Brexit wasn't implemented, because Brexit was a existential threat to the British establishment. Three years after the British um, voted for a Brexit, they still don't know how to get out of Europe today. And Donald Trump was very vocal about why Brexit should occur. And that was viewed as a threat. So, of course, the British didn't want Donald Trump to become president when he was promoting that. And, and people like Obama and Clinton were promoting the Remain vote Remain and Trans-Pacific Partnership. So they had interests in colluding with Brennan and the FBI to spy on us, to undermine us, and to assure that if Trump was elected president, he'd be weakened. And uh, now with all the information coming out, I think the president's going to realize that the British and the Australians were mocking him, telling him that, you know, your guys were up to no good. That's why we had to spy on them. When in reality, they were complicit in the sabotage effort against him. So I think we're going to have a very, very interesting next couple of months, maybe years, um, between ourselves and our so-called allies. And, um, you know, to the extent that they cooperate, I think uh, it's going to really... Uh, probably implicate a lot of uh, peop- officials under the Obama administration, as I explained. And that's a good thing for this country. Yeah, absolutely. Transparency is definitely what we need. We also need to restore a little bit of faith in our DOJ and FBI, yeah. CIA as well. So I think hopefully the declassification does that. Um, Trump's been throwing around the T word a lot lately, treason. Yeah. Do you think that there um, there were some you know treasonous activities that took place at high levels? I think um, this was a PSYOP. Um, that was designed for one reason and one reason only, and that was to attempt a coup against the president for something he had nothing to do with or did. He was an innocent person targeted by these nefarious characters who, in my opinion, are committed treason. An attempt to subvert the duly elected president and the institutions in this country, which we believe in and we hope protect us, meaning the rule of law, freedom of the press, and a free judicial system were undermined by the previous administration to overthrow our current president. I think that is treason. So when Donald Trump uses the T word, I don't think that's uh, an extreme adjective. In fact, it could possibly be a euphemism for what really happened. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, people's lives were, they tried to destroy a lot of our lives like myself and Flynn and others. But, you know, I wasn't going to sit back and take it. And I fought back, and Donald Trump fought back. While they were accusing him of everything, they were trying to charge him for obstruction for something he didn't do. Yeah. He was fighting back, just like I was fighting back. And why I did my part to expose Stefan Halper, as I explained with Chuck Ross and other things I was doing, going public, talking to you, wrote my book. I wasn't going to sit back and allow this to ever be repeated in my country. Wow. Um, so let's do a quick speed round if this yeah. is cool with you. I'm going to read you some names and you tell me just yes or no if you think that they've participated in treasonous activity. Sure. So treason, yes or no, speed round. James Comey. Yes. Peter Stroke. Yes. Loretta Lynch. Yes. McCabe. Yes. Mueller. Yes. Rosenstein. Yes. Hillary. Yes. The Oars. Yes. John Brennan. Yes. James Clapper. Yes. Valerie Jarrett. Yes. Obama. Yes. Wow. 100%. And it's a, it's a 10 for 10. And you know why the last person is the most important? Because he was the kingpin. When we're done with this investigation, the real investigation that Barr and and um, and Huber and Horowitz are looking into right now, ultimately it's going to go to the top. And it's going to it all emanates from Obama, Ben Rhodes, and all these people who were prodding these foreign governments to come after Americans and uh, associates of a rival campaign. Because I don't think the British, the Australians, the Italians, and any of these European countries would do this on their own. They just wouldn't. There's too much at risk, unless they had the blessing of the Obama administration. And uh, that's what's probably going to come out. It's scary. But, uh, you know, there's a trail Mm -hmm. that leads to them. And one of these trails that people forget is that I was paid $3,000 by Stefan Helper, 
to to meet with him, and now we know he was a spy. Now, who pay, where'd that three thousand come from? There's a paper trail, and uh, once we look at the source of that money, we're going to see you know who was actually running stuff on Helper and how high up that went. So that's something that you know I can't wait to, for it to be revealed. I think it's going to shock America. This is gonna <laughs> <laughs> got some bugs out here. Uh, so knowing what you know about Trump, um, obviously knowing him personally, do you think that what the treasonous activities this is going to get settled? We're going to get to the bottom of it. We're gonna there's going to be some justice. Do you think Obama even will face justice eventually? I think Donald Trump understood that he was facing an existential threat to his presidency and probably even his own freedom. The way they were trying to go frame after. him for treason, basically. Yeah, and his family, and you know, you know, other people involved with his personal life, and based on that alone, forget that they, you know, went after his associates for a moment. Um, I think he's going to have to fight back, and uh, you know, I think if uh, he doesn't fight back, what happened in 2016 is going to happen again. Look, there are rogue elements in the FBI, the the CIA, these foreign governments who have an interest in hurting him for what. For one, winning in 2016, and two, coming out of this Mueller report alive and emboldened. So if he doesn't fight back, you know, these people are going to come after him again. And uh, maybe the next time you're not going to have a guy like George Papadopoulos who actually goes vocal and tells the truth. They might go after another guy, frame him, who might not tell this story. And then we might be involved in a second psyop uh, against him that might really take him down. So if I was him... He's, he's facing a real choice now between uh, his own personal liberty and his presidency and uh, not upsetting foreign governments or the Obama administration. And I think he's going to have to throw all these people under the bus for the sake of this country. And I hope he is, and he's, and he's going to do it. I know uh, Tr Donald Trump, I know his team. I worked with him for 11 months. I was on his transition team. And he's not going to allow this to, to fly. Yeah, he, he said that... He's not. And he, he's not. Yeah, he said people 50, 100 years from now need to look back and realize that they can never do this again. Steve Bannon recently on yeah. CNN said this will be the most... This year coming up, 2019, will be the most vitriolic year in American history, including Civil War, including um, okay. Vietnam. Why do you think that is? What do you think is coming? Uh, I think that... First of all, I think it all already started. And it started with Devin Nunes, who's gone public stating that he has criminal referrals of former Obama administration officials, FBI officials, and maybe even CIA officials, okay? And I know that once these are revealed and there might be indictments on the other side, forget this guy, this Obama lawyer who got charged. He's a nobody. Mm, yeah. Okay. Greg Craig or yeah, whatever. Yeah, if it goes, I think that was just a, a hint, a warm-up act to what might be coming next, and that is you might have people like Strzok, Lisa Page Broussard, indicted, even McCabe. Seems like McCabe was the, the fall guy mm -hmm. for these people. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think McCabe wants to go to jail because it's one thing to go to, to prison for 11 nights like I did and laugh it off. It's another thing to go for possibly years, 10 years like he's looking at, for conspiracy. And it looks like everybody's trying to throw him on a conspiracy and lying and other things. Mm -hmm. that, and that's what Devin Nunes is talking about. So I think all these guys are going to start flipping on one another. And, um, you know, where it, where it leads, I think it's, I think Bannon's right. You know, it is going to be the most vitriolic moment in American history because one, so many on the left and in the mainstream media are not s satisfied with the Mueller report. They think that Mueller was in on it with Trump. Mm. Okay. They think that he was helping Trump. <laughs> yeah. That's why he didn't indict him. Let alone when indictments come on the other side, you're really going to see an uproar. Like this is a real coup. This is a dictatorship. Trump is going after the investigators, you know. That's what I predict is going to happen. But they could try and spin it any way they want. They're not going to be successful. And the media has basically been complicit the whole way. So oh, they yeah. have, they're, they're pot committed. They have to double down. They can't get out now. They're kind of committed to the, to the narrative they've been pushing. Do you think that— They've written books about yeah. it, the, Mike, the Isikoffs, the Corns, the MSNBCs, the CNNs. All these guys have been pr uh, propagating— this uh, conspiracy theory for two years. You think they knew that it was completely fake when they were pushing it, or were they just being told b bad information? Okay, here's what I think. I think that they were told bad information. They probably had a suspicion it was bad information, but they kept going with it. That's one. And two, do you know why I believe that? Because even CNN doesn't want me on their program now. CNN and MSNBC... Actually, MSNBC is better than CNN. I've actually had very interesting interviews on, a, on MSNBC with people who actually read my book, including Joy Reid. While CNN... Um, were talking about me like I was a Russian spy, a Russian agent for two years. 
And then when I go public with my story, Anderson Cooper cancels my appearance. Uh, other people cancel my appearance. They don't want this new story coming out. They just want it to be in the realms of Twitter and YouTube and maybe Fox News at the highest level. They don't want it to be in the mainstream media. But as the, as the thunder gets louder and as I become more vocal and as the president and his allies continue on this war path, it's going to be impossible to, to suppress the new evidence that's uh, coming out. So what's next for you personally? Um, obviously, you're out of jail now. You did, uh, was it 12 days? Yeah, 11 nights. Um, so, yeah, you're kind of like a free man playing canvas. What's next for you? What do you want to get involved in? <coughs> um, well, I, I spent the last six months writing my book, so I took up a lot of my time. Um, and I'm glad it came out and it's well-received. And uh, two, I want to finally get to meet my wife's family. Ah. I haven't. <laughs> that would be uh, I something you want to do. My, my wife's from Italy, and uh, mm -hmm. you know they they stole they took my passport from me, and I haven't been able to travel outside the country for two years. So one, I couldn't engage in my usual business, which was consulting abroad, and two, I couldn't meet my wife's family. So they were really excited to finally meet me, and that's the first thing I want to do. I want to get my passport back and go meet her family. Uh, I'm working on a docu series right now uh, about my life. Um, post Mueller and pre Mueller um, and what I'm doing here in California. And, um, you know, my wife's an actress now. She's going to be in a really big movie coming up uh, next summer. She's in, uh, she's doing some modeling stuff. So I'm really supporting her as she supported me for the last two years, oh, yeah. um, you know, cause she was really fighting for me a lot. And, uh, you know, she really sacrificed a lot for me, man. And, you know, she gave up her career in Europe to move with a guy who was being indicted and wow. was going to jail, and she didn't need to do that. I mean, trust me, she's, I'm not the only guy in the world that would that wants her, obviously. You know, she's a wonderful person, and she's beautiful. But that's just, so that's my focus now. And two, getting the story out, you know, and uh, seeing where it leads. I mean, just me talking over the last three weeks, I think, has made a huge impact. And it's also going to take a long time to deprogram Americans. I mean, I don't say that easily. I mean, I really feel that Americans were brainwashed for two years. As you said, this was a PSYOP against Americans. So a lot of what I'm talking about here with you and what Trump and other people are talking about on TV is probably confusing to so many people because everybody was fed this garbage. So it's going to take a long time to deprogram Americans and, um, you know, it's just a sad story. But, uh, you know, I don't think it's ever going to be repeated again. I think justice will be served. I think all of these uh, perpetrators of this real crime against our country are going to probably be indicted, go to jail. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a great moment in American history. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Thank you for being Thanks on with me. It was awesome. really good talking to you. Me too, man. I got you, you a uh, $25 gift card to CVS oh, <laughs> in case so you need to buy anything. Uh, thank you guys oh, for watching. Uh, please like, share, subscribe, all the good stuff. Link is in the bio for Deep State Target, George's book. It's fantastic. I just finished it. Get yourself a copy today. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you at the next one. Thanks a lot. Cool. Thank oh, you. Really oh, appreciate awesome. it, man. George, we should hang out in real life. Then we could be good friends. <laughs> <laughs>